Welcome, everybody. We would like to invite you to take you, your chairs to start with the intergenerational inquiry. All of you are welcome to celebrate the Jan of Future Generations Day. Then also I would like to invite our moderators and our speakers, please, to join us here on the stage. I want everyone to invite the, the, speaker. all the speakers. I would request everyone to take their seats, please. Today, half of the world's population is young people. But are we involved at a higher level decision making? process. Bula, and welcome everybody uh, to the intergenerational inquiry of COP23 happening here in Bonn uh, with our Fijian friends. So um, we have come a very long way. We have intergenerational equity in the Paris Agreement, and now we want to put it into action. So um, let me first introduce our speakers and welcome them on stage. So my name is Anna Bram. <laughs> I'm from the Foundation for the Rights of Future Generations. And first of all, I would like to invite um, our COI organizers for the Conference of Youth, Anna Boyale and Christian Deutschmeier. So, and uh, we have several more. <laughs> so, I would also like to invite Mr. Ovais Samat from uh, India, the UNFCCC Deputy Secretary, uh, Deputy Executive Secretary. Okay. <laughs> then also, Mr. Saran, Climate Ambassador and Special Envoy to the UNFCCC from Fiji. Also, we have. <laughs> Also, I'm very happy to uh, welcome Mr. Tomasz uh, Khrushchev from the SBI. He's the UNFCCC chair of the subsidiary body for implementation. And then also we have uh, our young speakers here. We have uh, Yula Pitamama from the Solomon Islands. Uh, welcome. And then we have Frederick, Victoria, Hanna Duigu, and Marilyn speaking from the young perspectives on climate change. And also we would like to invite furthermore um, Mrs. Marlene Mutt, uh, the ace focal point for Sweden and also a spokesperson for the European Union later on on the panel. And welcome and yeah, let's get this started. So. <laughs> so first of all, we will have the presentation for the Conference of Youth, the 13th um, of its kind, COI 13, and I would like to give Anna and Christian the stage. Thanks, everyone. Hello, hello, ah, yeah. perfect. Hi, everyone, um, this is Christian and I'm Anna from the COI 13 organizing team. Um, can I have a quick raise of hands? Who of you already knows Core 13? Yeah. Aye, okay, good. Thanks. Um, okay, let's briefly start. The Conference of Youth 13 this year taking place w in Bonn just last weekend was the largest youth gathering this year. We had um, the goal to, to empower youth to take climate action, to get young people from all over the world together, to share their knowledge, to share their experiences, to learn about climate change, um, and to bring this also home to their communities. And last weekend we got together actually 1,300 people. Okay, this is better. Okay, 
We got um, 1,300 people from all over the world together, actually from 114 nations to get together to work three days. Um, we had several workshops, um, panel discussions, seminars, and yeah. And here you can see on the map um, how many from all over the world, how many uh, participants we had. So nearly half of those 1,300 participants uh, did actually contribute to the program of COI by giving a presentation, a workshop, or um, also worth mentioning, we had a well-being space uh, dedicated to sustainable activism and a, an art space which we um, which we use for training on what we call artivism. Um, apart from that. Let's skip this. Um, we had, uh, can I go back here, yes. There's a, not only a conference of youth taking place in Bonn, but all over the world, as you can see here, we had regional and local conferences of youth, um, and they also contributed to the global conference of youth in Bonn by uh, live streaming, uh, sharing their ideas and concepts and projects, and some even sent their delegates. Um, and all of this took place under the overarching slogan of Tala no Amanda, Youth Ac Accelerating Climate Action. So, yeah. so I guess Tala no Amanda is a, uh, a concept which you all know by now. Um, and we actually put this into practice already by having Tala no sessions during COI as well. Um, and we raised questions on uh, where the burning issues lie in different regions what people actually do, what young people already do, creative solutions, and what kind of priorities they see for their leaders at COP23. Um, some of the uh, outcomes I can share here are less content related, but uh, I think equally important, and they are that we actually achieved to create what I think is meant by uh, the Talanoa spirit, because we did achieve to deeply listen to each other, to find mutual understanding, to and, and actually we found that we are not too far apart from each other in our opinions concerning climate justice, concerning uh, more ambitious mitigation and up adaptation measures. And that was a very nice outcome to see um, by coming together for and doing Talanoa. So I would hope that some of this Talanoa spirit we started with co 13 um, actually will be carried over here and will influence your negotiations as well and improve the final outcome of this COP23. <laughs> we prepared a little after movie, so enjoy this four minutes. Attention, attention. Welcome to COI 13. Setting up this huge event has been a lot of work for our entire team since around 10 months and it wouldn't have been possible without that many great people working together so closely. COI 13 was so 
huge, so huge in numbers of participants and so huge in numbers of nationalities that were represented, of people that came here uh, to share their experiences and their knowledge with other young people uh, to accelerate climate action. At no point in time I thought that the Core 13 could fail because we have such a great team. That obviously hasn't been the case before, not having sound. We can just enjoy the pictures. Once again, this is Safran from uh, Sri Lanka, representing the Earth Langa delegation, and thank you very much. And I would like to once again give a round of huge applause for the Koi team, working for nearly of nine months online and everything. <laughs> Great job, guys. So moving forward, now I would like to invite the uh, Yugatrana Sit uh, Sirivatsara to speak about the uh, Global South Scholarships opportunities. This call for you. Thank you, Safran and Anna. Um, dear Mr. Thomas, SBI Chair, Ambassador Saran, Ashwini, UNFCCC Climate Change Secretariat, members of media, my dear young friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good afternoon to all of you. Um, I'm Yugratna Shravastava from India, um, part of Plan for the Planet delegation to COP23 and also uh, the part of the coordination committee of the Global South Scholarships 2017. Um, I'm not going to take much time, but just briefly explain what we have been doing this year in Yungo with Global South Scholarships as a project along with my other colleagues. Um, so you know that young people around the world are actively engaged in efforts to address climate change, participation in multitudes of uh, initiatives at local, national, and international levels. And their strong commitment has not only gotten them to participate in UNFCCC conferences, but in 2009, young people were recognized as a constituency called as Yungo, which is <laughs> why we all are here. 
And in 2011, this status to young people became uh, the permanent status, status as a constituency. Although youth participation in UNFCCC processes has steadily grown, it continues to suffer widely from geographic distribution of origin of participants, and it's very disproportionate at times in terms of representation. While global south countries continue to suffer frontline impact of climate change, participation of young people from global south uh, is often sporadic and limited. Such underbalanced youth participation, it kind of undermines capability or representation of young people to formally serve as a voice in the negotiations. Um, Global South Scholarships 2017 is a project that is funded by the German government, the German Environment Ministry, and the German Development Ministry, BMUB and BMZ GIZ. And this year, it has run from August to and it's an ongoing project. And as a part of this, 30 young people from Global South were trained and brought into the negotiations. Um, about these 30 people, about 15 of them come from island states, and we have over 17 females from this. And an important aspect to note or how this gradually developed was um, in May intersessionals, we came up with this proposal of having Global South scholarships to bring in more people. And the German government and the ministries were very kind to support this initiative. And uh, we, did, we didn't want to uh, bring just token participation of Global South to these conferences. It was not like, oh, we bring a bunch of youth from Global South, but we wanted to have their effective engagement so they understand how overwhelming or how complicated UNFCCC space in general can be. So one very um, important element of Global South scholarships this year also has been that it came coupled with uh, a capacity building program of GSS as a part of which the delegates went through uh, two months of intense online training sessions. Uh, which were some of the training sessions were also public and made open to Yungo. In terms of numbers, we received 3,400 applications from 140 countries of the world, and we're very thankful to the Yungo and the bottom lining team members who helped with the selection processes in selecting uh, best 30 people out of this. They're all here. You can see them with the GSS badges. And uh, with this, I mean, while we continue to engage uh, young people in the processes. Uh, I'm very, very grateful once again to Secretariat, to the ministries for this opportunity given. And once again, on behalf of myself, Tim, who is in the audience, Julius, who is not here from COI team, and Sagar, uh, we would like to uh, thank everyone. And we look forward to continuing uh, this process of engaging more young people from Global South into UNFCCC processes and in Yungo as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jürg Ratner. Uh, if some of you have um, has followed the GSS uh, process, it was a lot of work, and uh, I'm really thankful and grateful that you have done that. So, yeah. Vinaka um, Vakalevo. Next, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Ovais Samad. He's the UNFCCC Deputy Executive Secretary, and I'm very happy that he's here with us. So please give a big round of applause and welcome him here on stage. First of all, a very warm, warm welcome to all of you to the COP23 on behalf of the UN Climate Change Secretariat, which I represent. Great pleasure, great honor to see you all here. And this is a very important topic, and this is something very personally close to me, and that's why I felt it's important that I should be here to share some thoughts from my perspective uh, on what you're doing here. And first of all, also, I'd like to thank all the organizers here. Uh, that's ACE, Connect for Climate, Youth Climate, and COI. COI 13, that is. And uh, these organizations have put together this side event. Extremely important. I strongly and personally believe that what we are talking about in terms of changes in global trends, uh, such as climate change or human mobility or security, that cannot happen without the engagement of youth, children, and education. So this, what you're doing is extremely important. It touches the 
grassroots and uh, the real people who would be responsible for our futures, collective futures. So that is extremely important. And another thing I strongly, strongly believe is if we are to make a societal change, a change that is sustainable, a change that is meaningful, that needs to happen at an early stage. No point teaching me much uh, or others who are negotiating and who are the politicians. Uh, they have a very important job to do. But I think the societal change needs to happen at an early stage, at a stage uh, when kids are still uh, in the schools, uh, various levels, including now also in the universities. So the youth have an extremely important role to play. And what you're doing here is very, very important. And what I can also say uh, from the Climate Change Secretariat point of view, we are there to listen to your views, to understand what uh, your challenges are, what your perspectives are, and we'll try to bring that to the attention uh, of the parties who are negotiating the various parts of the climate change architecture, the agreements that have been agreed upon by the world leaders. So we need to bring to their attention what the youth, the children, uh, are saying about their own future. So that is, I feel, is our role. Not only a role, but our responsibility for us to do that. And uh, we would continue to do that. And very, very pleased to see many of you here and people in the panel who are uh, knowledgeable about the changes that they want to make, the, what they need to do to protect our climate, uh, climate environment and the places that we live in all parts of the world, north, south, rich, poor, developed, developing, doesn't really matter. Climate change doesn't have any borders. So uh, we are all together in it and we need to work together collectively and individually and that's what matters and this is a good representation of that process. So I wish you all the very best and you can count on our full support. And thank you very much. Thank you especially also to Adriana for organizing this event. Thank you, Adriana. Gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Owasi Samad, the UNFCCC Deputy, Sec Ex Deputy Executive Secretary. And now we will have a group picture with the uh, panelists, and I would like to invite uh, the, sec the Deputy Secretary, Executive Secretary once again to the stage. And also I would like to invite the Mr. Dio Saran, Climate Ambassador and Special Envoy to UNFCCC, Bula from Fiji. And I would like to also invite Mr. Thomas Shakuza from UNFCCC, the Chair of Subsidiary Bodies for Implementation, to have a quick picture with the panelists. Uh, please, I would like to invite everyone. That And also, I would like to invite Ms. Malin Mott from the ACE Focal Point for Sweden and ACE Spokesperson for the European Union.
Thank you everyone for the cooperation for the picture. And now I would like to invite Mr. Dio Saran, the Climate Ambassador and Special Envoy to UNFCCC from Fiji, Bula. The podium is yours. Thank you, and a very good afternoon. I must say my first encounter with the youth constituency, the Yungo, came in my consultations in, uh, in May here in Bonn. Uh, we were having consultations for two weeks, as you can imagine, and we had a big room up in the uh, conference center where we used to bring in all the constituencies, uh, the civil society constituencies, and, and have consultations. And every time the, con the, con the constituencies came and uh, there were uh, the few of the people there and we had from the presidency side and the room was most of the time empty. The first time the room got fully packed when, the, when we had the, the, the dialogue with the youth constituencies. And that was a first sign of energy that I could see and the zeal that I could see in the youth uh, uh, constituencies, the Yungo team. So congratulations for that, uh, the zeal and the, and the energy that you are carrying. And I can see that uh, throughout the consultations we had in Rabat and in, in various other constituencies throughout the year. And it clearly demonstrates uh, a, a very strong commitment that you have to, uh, towards, towards climate change. Mr. Bulabinaka, and very good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure and honor to be here today for this intergenerational inquiry. Let me start by thanking Yungo for your participating in this open dialogue yesterday. You made it clear that how you s s are such a critical part of climate solutions today and also in the future. This was the first ever dialogue of such a nature between parties and non-parties, stakeholders, and you, we hope that the youth continue to be part of such a dialogue in future COPs. This was a huge success, and we are very proud of delivering this at this COP, the first ever open dialogue between parties and non-parties. I, like I, I would like to acknowledge the presence of youth from the Pacific who have made it here from all the way, halfway around the world. This is a big achievement, and we are encouraged that youth from the Pacific and all parts of the world are ensuring that your voices are part of the global climate discourse. As it is, you will, you will live with the impacts of climate change uh, unfold in the future. Dear friends, the presidency is aware of what the youth wants in particular. We understand your concerns on the importance of education, on public awareness, in ensuring that the play Paris Agreement actually works. At COP23, as COP23 presidents, we place great focus on education and how the six elements need to translate themselves into funded work programs. This is where the missing link often is. And this is a challenge, but not when, when we tap into the other's energy to act. In relation to public awareness, states cannot do it alone. Hence, we are calling for a grand collision which is recognizing the importance of the important role of youths, civil societies, private sector, and states working together to accelerate climate action and enhance the ambition of the Paris Agreement. We are proud that you all are amazing youths are part of our grand coalition. The world needs leadership on climate change, and it is encouraging to see young people stepping up to this challenge. The Paris Agreement implementation will need your energy, commitment, passion, and drive to make, it a, make the world a better and cleaner and safer place. As my Honorable Prime Minister, Josiah Warenge Beni Marama said, and I quote, the generations, old and young, need to come together to tackle this crisis. We need to learn from young people like you how to take advantage of new technology. We, we need you to demand changes to the way we do things. And I must emphasize, we need you to demand changes the way we do things. 
in politics, in business, and in the running of our daily lives and in our societies. With this, I look forward for your constructive engagement of Yongo over the next days, and we count on your support to helping us to make this COP a grand success. Winaka Wekalewu, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Saran. Uh, and now I would like to welcome Mr. Tomasz Khrushchev from the SBI. He's the UNFCCC Chair of the Subsidiary Body for Implementation. Please give him a wall wa warm welcome and a big applause. Thank you very much, um, dear colleagues. Um, Dear delegates, it's it's real pleasure and honor to participate in this intergenerational inquiry during the Young and Future Generations Day at COP23. This is the day to celebrate your leadership. This is the day to celebrate innovative solutions to tackle climate change. As the chair of SBI, I've seen <coughs> active participation of you and your colleagues in this intergovernmental process since at least five or six years ago. And I must say that, for instance, adoption of the Doha work program on Article 6 of the Convention wouldn't be possible if the number of young delegates pushed those more traditional to work in a less standard way. It is thanks to you that we would be that we were able to, to, to agree in Doha, and it's thanks to you that this program eventually evolved into the action for climate empowerment. I am also aware that you are very deeply involved in implementing multiple climate projects at the local, national level, on the regional level, and also on international level. And your energy and commitment is needed for the transformational change towards a low emission and climate resilient, climate neutral development. This transformation includes changing values and behaviors. This transformation includes public participation in climate change decision-making and, in particular, actions on local level where your predecessors, who are sometimes might be in power, need um, an injection of your energy and your enthusiasm. Climate action must include fostering access to information, must include empowering of all generation and your generation in particular, and soon your children's generation, raising awareness, education, and implementing practical solutions. Dear colleagues, dear young delegates, with the adoption of Paris Agreement, we must now speed up and scale up our actions at all levels. And as you know, the next year's COP, COP24, will take place in December in Poland, in my country. And I'd like to welcome you all to Poland, and I would like to, to invite you all to Poland and we are very much looking forward to working with the constituency of young people. And we don't need just your voices in this process. We most of all need your energy. We most of all need your willingness to actively address climate challenges. And finally, I would like to encourage you to continue working, especially to 
return to your countries and establish partnerships with your governments, with your local governments, with the organizations of business, trade unions, to raise the awareness and enhance implementations of your national agendas. Because you are the leaders and you are the champions of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again for um, giving the uh, remarkable speech by Mr. Thomas, uh, UNF Triple C Chair of the Subsidiary Bodies and Implementation. Okay, so now we have great young people, inspirational stories of change, youth implementing climate action worldwide. So we, I would like to firstly invite Ms. Lua from Lua Pitama from the Solomon Islands. She is from the fisheries officer from the Choisi province in the Solomon Islands. Is it working? Hello, everyone. Great. First of all, I would like to thank you, organizers, for making this time available for me to give my stories and also to the distinguished guests who are here with us this afternoon, thank you so much for your time. I'm Iula Pitamama from Solomon Island, and I'm here for this COE and also including this COP as a youth representative of our country. We call our project Pacific Voices in Unison. We're here to share our stories, and we are youth coming from different countries in Pacific Islands, and we're here to share our stories. And I would like to share my stories about climate change for personally for myself and how we respond to it especially for my work I used to work with Red Cross before that was two years ago and we are doing the work on the community especially on the preparedness for disaster and one of the common disaster that we face in my country especially Solomon Island including all the Pacific Islands is tropical cyclone and what we did is that we go to schools and communities and helping them to prepare on what they're supposed to do during those times. What they're supposed to do, like, for example, when the kids, when it's heavy rainfall, they have to stay in the house which is strong enough for them, not just roaming around. That's what we told the students in the schools and also even in the communities too. So that's what we do on awareness on how we did with the schools and the communities. And from that, we believe that when the cyclones happen, they will know what they do. One important thing that we as a Pacific Islanders always forget about is our emergency kit preparing there. So we always encourage them, make sure we prepare something there so that in case of disaster, especially when cyclone comes, they will have some water there to drink some food there to eat after the, during that time of disaster. Especially, I'm talking about cyclone, tropical cyclone, which is one of the uh, disaster that really related to climate change. And also, for now, I'm working as a fishery officer in my province for the government of Solomon Island. And in related to climate change, I was working. I'm I'm working now with the community and we are like en encouraging the community to do the work, especially we know that coral bleaching is one of the main effect of climate change due to the temperature, due to the increase of temperature. So, you know, it's a lot of stress that already there in the coral reef lives. So what we encourage to the community is that we encourage them if they can manage, make their uh, resource manage, or we call them man, uh, marine manage area, we they can reduce the stress, that stress on their marine resources. So that's one of the indirect way because we believe and we also understand that climate change also affect our food security. So we 
as a Solomon Islander or people in the Pacific, we really depend entirely on our marine resource, especially for protein, especially on fish. We need that from our sea. So that's what I d I'm doing now with my uh, country, especially on my work as a ground uh, or as a provincial officer right in my province. I'm there helping the community, trying to make them recognizing the resource that they have, keeping them so that when uh, even we all know as already as I already mentioned that coral bleaching is one of the things and we also helping to sustain the life of our marine life so that it will still tomorrow we will still have fish to eat to help us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and I would like to Thank you very much, Ms. Luha Pitamama. So next up is Mr. Frederick Omar from Yangu. It's, it's over to you. Good afternoon. So basically, I'll start by saying young people have always been considered to be consumers most of the time. Most of the time, we sit on the dining table without much concern on where the food is coming from, for example. However, over time, we've realized that we are getting a lot of food poisoning. And why, are, why am I saying this? That for a very long time, young people have been doing a lot of projects and programs within their individual countries, but then that is just to adapt to a problem that is not being solved at all. So therefore, what are we doing? We are basically creating an institution out of a problem we are supposed to solve. So. What have we been doing, for example, in Kenya? As, as the youth, we've been working hard to bring young people to the realization that some of that our generation or our future is at stake here. The adult court are playing, are taking risks with, our uh, with, 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 with the climate and, and with our future. So therefore, how do we get on board? So we've been trying to align the projects and initiatives of young people within the climate response strategies within our in, uh, individual countries. My organization is Pan-African, the African Youth Initiative on Climate Change. And that, therefore, we've used to basically create platforms at the continental level, uh, which we call the African Youth uh, Conference on Climate Change, which has really also brought together projects across Africa in terms of our young people are trying to adapt and build their own resilience. Because for us in Africa, this is about survival. It's, 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 not, it's not about anything else. It's, it's about our life, it's about our heritage, it's, it, it's about that cultural fabric and social fabric that we have in the African continent. And we are quickly losing that because the global north uh, are behaving like they want to mitigate anything, but then exporting some of their uh, dirty industries to Africa, displacing people from their homes, losing that key heritage that we have as a young generation. So therefore, what is the point? If you look at the irony that exists, for example, in climate change, last year we were in Marrakesh, and we were closer to a renewable energy plant that, that, that people were going to visit. This year, the COP23 is hosted by Fiji, a Pacific island that is under threat. And we are in Germany, in Bonn, close to one of the biggest pits of coal. And then we consume secondary information, and we are told the U Europe or European Union is doing a lot about climate change. So I'm left as a young person to wonder, are we institutionalizing climate change as a business empire, or are we interested in solving it as a problem? Because next year we will be in Poland again. The other year we will be in another country. What, what, what are we doing as uh, the, the generation that exists now? Because you, know, you borrowed the climate from us. And the, the worst you can do is to give it back to us the way you found it. Because we expect more. So it, it, it's something you borrowed from us, the young generation, and we are not going to have a generation if everything will be messed up at the end of the day. So I think it's very key, and I want to thank uh, organizations like uh, the YMCA Global, uh, Forum Norway, and other organizations that are working so hard to bring young people to get primary information and knowledge and be able to understand that we risk being in this cycle for as long as possible to keep business people in business. Thank you.
Once again, thank you very much, Mr. Frederick Kumar, for giving the glimpse of how young people get involved in climate action. So next we have Ms. Victoria DiMello from the United Nations Volunteer Youth Representative. Good afternoon, everyone. Respected panel members, respected audience. My name is Victoria de Mello and I am a United Nations volunteer from the city of Salvador in Brazil. Salvador has a beautiful tropical coastline, a deep blue sea, green jungle, and in my opinion, Salvador is the most beautiful city in the world. However, Salvador is going through immense challenges. It's one of the most unequal and one of the most violent cities in Latin America, with 65% of our population being young the majority don't even have access to higher education. We are facing environmental challenges and environmental pressures as well. I stand before you today as both a product of this beautiful trouble setting, but as well as a potential solution to it. I'm not a celebrity, I'm not a technical expert, I'm not a politician. I'm an active, young and concerned volunteer. Today in the world, there are over 1.2 billion people between the ages of 15 and 24. And as we've heard, we are aware of the risks of climate change. And of course we are, we have our entire futures to lose. My volunteering journey took me to the United Nations Environmental Program in Kenya and to my current assignment with UNDP in Bangkok. Um, then I was together not only alone, there are over a billion other volunteers in the world, and 380 million are young volunteers. Volunteerism can truly harness the energy of young people for change. And that's why UNV deploys young people every year to the field to understand how to contribute. And that's why UNV as well advocate for volunteerism to become an integral means of implementation for the Paris Accord and for the Agenda 2030. But let me tell you one thing, volunteers are often overlooked. That's why volunteerism needs to be constantly advocated for and supported. It's important as well to measure and evaluate the impact that volunteerism can have. And a great example for that is the UN's flagship publication, the State of World Volunteerism Report. And the next one will be released in 2018, but you'll be allowed to see a sneak peek now. So if you could press the play on the video. No. All right. Yes, <laughs> thank you. One billion people volunteer their time and efforts to extend support, especially in times of crisis. Such volunteerism is a big resource for peace and development. So how can governments and other actors best engage with volunteerism? Do they need to? Does it really matter? For us, the State of the World Volunteerism Report is really our flagship publication. Uh, we're able to obviously gather the best experience around volunteerism around the theme of resilience. By demonstrating evidence of the value of volunteerism in building communities that are strong enough to survive and rebuild, to sustain and develop, and to include those furthest left behind, the report reinforces the need to link global strategies and commitments with the grassroots action taking place day in and day out by volunteers at the front lines. And as you can see, the next report will be launched in 2018 and it's original research from 15 communities around the world. And some of the preliminary findings shows that volunteers on the ground in the front line are actually helping people cope and adapt. And young people are taking their role. When young people are permitted leadership roles, young people are bringing new ideas, identifying priorities, challenging the norms, and really feeding back into their experience to decision-making processes. The report also shows how important it is to develop an enabling environment for volunteerism. UNV already works with member states to guarantee that legislation and the proper uh, policies are in place. 
but we need to ensure the voluntary also works in harmony with other cross-cutting pillars of the Agenda 2030, such as South-South cooperation. As a matter of fact, over 80% of United Nations volunteers today are coming from the Global South and serving in the developing world, like myself. Voluntarism also needs to integrate technology, such as UNV's online platform that allows young people to contribute to climate action from their homes. Respected panel members, respected audience, volunteering took me on a journey from Brazil to Thailand. Volunteering and youth are a powerful combination for climate action, but they are not enough. We need investments, we need programs to widen access, we need innovations to support young people and the actions of ordinary young people to contribute to sustainable development. UNV stands ready to support and to deploy more young volunteers and to guarantee stronger volunteer infrastructures. Youth volunteerism help climate action go further, faster, and together for peaceful, resilient communities and empowered youth. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. That was a very inspiring speech. Um, and I hope that all the decision makers here inside the room have heard what you have said, because that was great. Thank you. So now I would like to give um, at first uh, the stage to Ms. Hanna Pintusava. She is from the UN Habitat Climate Change Photo Competition. We will first show the video, and then uh, she will give her speech. Please give a round of applause. We are climate change. We are climate change. We are climate change. By participating in this competition, I intended to raise some awareness regarding the role of every one of us in making our cities resilient to climate change. On my picture, you can see a floating forest in a Dutch city of Rotterdam. There are 20 trees calling attention to art, innovation and sustainability. Next to it, you would see a house, a floating pavilion and a recycled park. And all of them are floating in the water. My picture focuses on engaging young people in tree growing as part of our My Climate Smart School program, which is to enhance our forest landscape towards carbon sequestration. The picture describes a typical German environment in which bicycles are part of a daily lifestyle for everyone. The picture describes how bicycling plays an important part in the reduction of carbon, carbon emissions around the world. My photo presents an Iranian citizen uses a climate-friendly transport. Omid installed solar panels on top of his wheelchair to provide sustainable power. We are climate change. We are climate change. We are climate change. We are climate change. Be part of that. When was the last time you saw a young person with a smartphone in their hands? <laughs> maybe just before the session started? Or maybe a young person next to you is typing something right now? <laughs> it's not so rare to see, right? Um, most smartphones today have a high resolution camera and internet access. So that allows anyone to make a picture and post it online in just a second. And isn't it great? Having these two tools, photography and internet, allows anyone to uh, raise awareness of important issues such as climate change 
and advocate an action. The uninhabited youth photography competition not only reached young people from all over the world by making good use of social media and giving scope for creativity, but it also highlighted the very positive, social, uh, very positive actions the cities are taking. And while capturing solutions to climate change in their cities, young people like me are able not only to explore our city climate change solutions, but also to share them online. Cities from all over the world were represented in the UN, Youth Habit, uh, UN Habitat Youth Photo Competition. Renewable energy, tree planting, solar lighting, recycling, clean cooking, solar powered wheelchair, youth education, solar irrigation pump, sustainable mobility, clean transit, waste separation, cycling, floating structures. These are all the diverse climate change solutions that were represented in the top 24 winners of the competition. And you can explore many more online if you follow the hashtag we are climate change. And I would especially like to address young women who are underrepresented in photography and photojournalism and encourage you to share your creative climate change solutions. And um, photography is a very powerful way to communicate uh, issue or phenomena. As my favorite photographer, brilliant Elliot Erwitt said, the whole point of taking pictures is so that you don't have to explain things with words. I hope one day to see the world where we don't need to use words or pictures to explain the importance of climate change. But unless it is our reality, let's take photos, let's write posts, let's communicate, care, and take actions. And to show how many people in this room care about climate change, I would like to take a selfie with you. And of course, with the young people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, I would like to see the selfies for myself, OK? <laughs> OK, so next one, uh, we have Mrs. Uh, Diogo Ogua. And she is a youth ambassador of the German Youth Dialogue our climate, our future, that just recently took place, and I'm very uh, curious of what she has to say. So please give her a big round of applause to her. Hello, <laughs> dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, the opportunity to present our results of the Youth Dialogue, Our Climate, Our Future. Um, the Youth Dialogue was initiated by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment in order to raise awareness for the perspective, especially of young people. My name is Dolgo Ogua, and I am one of the youth ambassadors um, around 200 young people discussed about climate change and climate protection in three different uh, dialogue events in three different German cities. And um, we received information on national and international climate politics and intensely exchanged opinions. Based on that, we um, answered questions about our views on climate change and climate protection. Uh, for further information, uh, about our rapid, you can visit the website or scan the QR code. Uh, today, we, the randomly selected youth ambassadors, are here to present the youth report that sums up the results of the dialogues. We claim that um, climate change is an issue that influences other worldwide problems. 
acting against climate change undoubtedly it implies acting against global problems such as hunger and poverty. It is important to consider that we are the most affected generation by climate change and therefore it is our great concern not only for our lives but for the lives of people in regions that are more affected. Consequently, we have a high motivation to act immediately and so should the, the governments. Hence, the participation of youth is all dominant for us. It is essential that our voice is heard. That's why we demand a steady, powerful and institutionalized youth participation in international climate politics and need the empowerment of youth delegations for the negotiations. We call for the stop of dependence on fossil fuels and as well as the subsidies for this energy with regard to achieve the limit of 1.5 degrees global warming. We are convinced that governments have to invest more in renewable energies. One should emphasize that we find it especially difficult to uh, be climate friendly when it comes to vacation, travel, and of course, um, electronic devices. Uh, the lack of practical alternatives in the age of digitalization and globalization is for us the main reason for this difficulty. Concerning this aspect, we demand the expansion um, of affordable cl climate friendly public transport. Lastly, we advocate um, a further funded environment education. We suggest a playful introduction for children in su sustainability um, as well as international cooperation in order to implement the recommendation. We believe that climate protection is an opportunity to improve the quality of life. It is something that cannot be delayed anymore. It is an urgency. So stop talking, start acting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have Miss Marilyn Bok Mwati. Uh, she's um, a youth delegate for Decarbonize and um, Decolonize 2017. So please give her a big round of applause as well. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marlene Mwita from, I'm 16 and I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, so I, I realized that you all smiled once I said that I'm 16 and I bet you're all wondering why I'm 16 and I'm here, because most of the time when we mention youth, we mean those above 18. And the reason why <laughs> is because, um, of course, I'm here to talk about climate change, but Taking It Global Education decided to look at the problem differently this time. They uh, partnered with 17 countries and over 2,000 students under the age of 18 to collaborate using various social media tools such as WhatsApp, Google Drives and the Taking Global Education main website in order for us to communicate and compile our, our ideas for a project called Decarbonize, Decolonize. Um, so, sorry. So for the project, um, we worked, we were given activities on the main site for, for Taking Global Education. And I'm not gonna lie, it was quite demanding because I had to stay up late to finish my research blogs or waking up early to go for video conferences with students from all over the world. But the stress and the demand was well worth being here today. And the climax of the entire event was representatives from each of the 17 countries coming here to Germany this week in order to compile our ideas and write a white paper on the project Decarbonize, Decolonize. So why were we so interested on the topic? Uh, most of us were really driven by the fact that this was our chance. Whenever we think of people under the age of 18, our voice isn't really included. It's the youth are included, those above 18, but those under 18 are taken to be inactive. 
And so it was our chance to say otherwise. It was our chance to use our voice for good and do something, to show that whatever is left behind at the end of the day is ours to pick up. So many of us initially didn't really understand the connection bet between decolonization and decarbonization. So of course, when you think about the two, you the first thing that comes to mind is with colonization came the boom in the industrial sex in the industrial sector, which led to higher carbon emissions. But what we once we dug deeper and found was that um, was that. Uh, oftentimes in climate decisions, some countries and some communities, such as indigenous communities, end up being left behind and their voices aren't taken in account. And so um, in our white paper, we discuss um, three topics, talking about decolonizing our mindsets and our livelihoods, decarbonization and what the youth can do about it. And so um, in um, in the youth sector, at the end of the white paper, we decided at first when we sat down and had diverse, amazing, complex conversations about the issue, we were going to give you solutions because that's what we all want. But then we realized that depending on who you are, where you are, you may have a different angle to tackle the issue from. So instead of giving you purely solutions, we decided to give you questions that you could answer in order to determine what you can do as a person and what your country can do in order to solve the big issue. Some of the questions include, how does colonization affect you on a local, global, and national level? Um, who is included and whose voices are ignored when it, when it comes to climate change decisions and what can we learn from them? How can we work with, rather than for, indigenous communities and left behind communities in order, in order for them to be included? And what do, how can you decolonize your mindset? And what does this teach you about your climate action? And so at the end of the day, um, we, we need both decolonization and decarbonization to happen at the same time in order for them to be effective and long lasting. In order for nations to decide to come together, sit down, decolonize our mindsets, and work together as a world, against this ticking time bomb that we call climate change and set aside our differences and views. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Marlene, and uh, thank you for bringing uh, this to the attention. We have 16 years old now at COP23, and this is to, yeah. And this is because of the great support that young people get here from the UNFCCC Secretariat. And I would like to personally thank Adriana Valenzuela for all the work that she has done. Uh, give her a big round of applause, please. <laughs> Patricia Espinosa has also done a lot for young people here and we would like to continue this dialogue. Um, right now we have one speaker left and I just want to let you know that after this, we will have a question and answer session. So please uh, stay here and um, yeah, prepare something. We want to get engaged with you and start this dialogue right now. And now I would like to welcome Mrs. Marlene Mot. She's the ACE uh, National Focal Point for Sweden and also ACE spokesperson for the European Union. And I would really like to welcome you on stage right here with a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it's a um, true honor to be here and uh, to make these um, final remarks. Um, and uh, I'm so inspired listening to you. Um, and uh, we'll take, uh, continue taking that energy back into the negotiations. And um, um, thank you also for um, inviting me on behalf of Sweden and also for EU to take these final notes. Young youth empowerment is key for effective climate uh, policy. Awareness and also participation is key. And 
education is so crucial, it's important. So we need to enhance and improve youth empowerment in to climate actions because just well we won't do it without you or us together it's not us and you it's us we all together um, therefore this is an uh, important issue for the european union and um, we try to take a strong part in the negotiation process in uh, empowerment um, here at the cop for example, uh, also, moreover, Sweden and also several European uh, delegations, we have uh, youth representatives in the delegations, and our ears are big, <laughs> we listen, and we inter interact with each other, and we learn from each other. Uh, it becomes much better because of that. Because uh, um, we are all decision makers, it's not us, just the decision makers. Um, back at home, my youngest daughter, no, sorry, my oldest daughter, uh, she's 12, and she's the decision maker for the menu at home. She's vegetarian. Two years ago, when she was 10, she decided, okay, I skipped the meat, and okay, we all approve, of course, and we adapt, and we adapt. So she's the major decision maker when it comes to the dishes back at home. Um, so this, this is not uh, the future, it is here and now. I think it's Im important that we don't talk about decision makers for tomorrow and decision makers for today. Um, we are, um, right now I'm here at the COP uh, in the Swedish and the, in the EU delegation. Okay, I'm 47, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so I'm in the older generation, um, but okay. Uh, soon you will take my place and you already have a very strong place um, here at the COP. And uh, we want to continue listening because um, the young, you're already the champions, I would say, for climate action. So let's continue in the dialogue here afterwards and, uh, and uh, listen to one another. Thank you very much. So. Yeah, okay. Can I send you questions for everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Malin Mort, for the closing remarks. Now I open the door for close questions, and we have two mics running up. So yeah, please go ahead. There's one from here. I'll take three questions, and then I will put to the panel. Yes. Please uh, uh, say who, from where are you, your name, and your country, and then for whom you're addressing, always a general question. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Amanda. I am from Zambia, but I actually work for the United Nations Volunteers. Uh, thank you very much for all the inspirational speeches. I'm really, truly inspired. I just wanted to ask the audience, can you raise your hand if you're a decision maker? Okay, this is an intergenerational inquiry. I would have loved to see more decision makers so that we could have an even more in-depth conversation with such inspirational uh, recommendations and suggestions that we've heard from all the speakers that have spoken today. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. And there was someone from... <coughs> we had Sherin from Sudan. Yeah. Can we pass the mic to her? Yeah. Okay, so it's about decision making. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I just want to say a few things. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, stress on what my colleagues here from Africa and from the island said before. For us, it's not just capacity building or training uh, or just trying to do new things or just jobs. Climate change changes our lives if we had one in the future. Uh, climate change uh, really affects us, our countries, 
uh, our people in the land. Uh, it's really affect our future. I'm not sure am I going to be 47 years old to have a 12 years old daughter or not with this. We already have 50 degrees uh, centigrade in Sudan. 50, 52, 53, it's normal situation. Uh, our uh, um, rainfall decreased from 300 millimeter uh, for um, a range of uh, falling to 100, and that affects our food security, it affects our economy, it affects uh, the living hoods because we are a developing country. Uh, in fact, we are the uh, one of the least developing countries. So for us, it's not just meetings, uh, conferences, it's, it's our lives. It's really our life, what we are talking about here. Okay? Uh, about the ACE, the education, public participation, and public awareness, uh, I think young people in, in, uh, in third world, global no uh, south, exactly, needs to, uh, sorry, they don't need, they deserve, actually. They deserve to know what, what's going to happen to them, they deserve to be ready and to be prepared for what's coming if we didn't have like uh, mitigation in the, in the right way. Uh, science, the IPCC report said that we are moving to 3.4 per, uh, percent in, in increase in degrees. Uh, we are searching, uh, us as Africans, we are looking, uh, our ambition is for 1.5 and by these numbers, even the indices, even the indices, we are we are reaching 3.4. Uh, uh, sorry, so this is not going to be uh, satisfying for us. This is uh, not something to give away, because uh, actually we are talking about several generations. We are talking about several countries. We are talking about millions, millions of people. And 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 if we are talking about next and future generation, then we have to consider. Uh, the youth, including in uh, the capacity building, the public awareness, and the public participation. And if it's public, then why we have to just put the governments there, or just to put the uh, NGOs there, observers, and, and, and so. If it's really public, then we need to make it public. And education is a key issue for us also, because we depend on the kids. We depend on the kids for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can take one more and then we can go to the panel. I would request everyone to make it quick and short and sweet that we can answer the question quickly. Thank you so much for the um, very touching and um, very inspirational presentations. I think it's exactly people like you who bring the necessary ambition and commitment and collaboration to climate action. Um, my name is Nadine and I'm um, colleagues with Victoria as we both support um, UNV. I wanted to ask um, whether you think and to which extent volunteerism can help to connect generations, connect the North and the South and also to connect consumers and producers in order to drive awareness and solidarity among and within generations. Thank you so much. Thank you. So <coughs> I'll just repeat the questions. So the first one was asked about how many young people are, I mean, how, what are the gateways that young people are being given opportunity to in be involved in the decision making level? So anyone can reflect on that. And the other one is what the effect of climate change that has uh, made in uh, the lo in developing countries and the least developed countries, how, how are they moving on? And then the uh, last question was about uh, volunteerism, how far that will go to an extent of achieving. So everyone, um, whoever wants to, I mean, there's FM mics you can reflect upon. Uh, Frederick, please, yeah. Yeah, maybe to start with the last question. I think uh, close to 80% of youth initiatives in this room today are, are, are on a voluntary basis. I, 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 people are not paid to organize themselves and to do projects and do programs and push education projects wherever they come from. So in terms of connecting people globally, I, I can give you even an example of, for example, the YMCA. It connects what people from the global south and the global north, creating a common platform to basically push 
climate change response and always making sure that in every COP to basically get the primary information and not the secondary information we get from news that is always wrong on our countries are really green and then when you go to those countries you don't really see that green perspective for example so i think that is very key uh in terms of in terms of uh, uh global south and capacity I, I think i could give you two examples now in kenya the maasai youth are watching as their parents uh, lose their cattle and livestock and are selling are forced to sell their livestock at five dollars just not to end up with the dead cows and nothing Another s example is uh, in the northern part of Kenya, we have pokots. For you to get married, you have to fill a whole shed uh, of, 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 of your own laws with cows. And then you have drought killing almost all the herds of cattle around. So you, 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 you are completely disrupting a social setting of a, comp of a community because of climate change. And that is why we are saying for those from the Pacific Islands, for those from Africa, it's 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 beyond the talk. It's 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 about survival. I, it's food. People going hungry for weeks, trekking, looking for pasture and water. So it's it's about life and death for us, uh, because we won't lack that capacity to adapt. And the worst part, bit of it is, as you try to adapt, those who are responsible are meeting more. So I think that is that is the worst bit of it for us. And and we hope that. Uh, we will stop coming to cops to talk, and that for once we'll have uh, a legal document and, and, and a proper program and rules of engagement for us to, tol to solve the problems one and all. So I think, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there was a question about, yeah. <coughs> thank you for your comments and your questions. And I think what I would like to add is um, the sense of purpose and togetherness that volunteering and also acting towards a bigger purpose uh when i was hearing the the coy findings and everything that happened in the conference it really strikes me that like the sense of togetherness puts volunteers together and this is the most intergenerational impact that any action can have when um, everyone are in together in the same room, actually working towards climate change. Because uh, as we've seen here, and I was really inspired by my colleagues here on how much climate change is pressing, uh, if all of us don't start acting together as one on this, I don't think there's uh, much future for us to be waiting on. So this sense of belonging and the sense of purpose can be very powerful. And on that, I also strike not only intergenerational, but on multi-stakeholder basis. So it would be great to see this room here full of more decision makers, but at the same time, bringing those conversations home. I think that the most important day of the COP will be the day that this conference ends, and people that are here as observers, as decision makers, regardless, come back and bring those actions home, because this is also on the core of volunteerism, right? Uh, bringing those actions and putting your time and putting your efforts into making a difference. So I really hope and I urge for everyone in this room here to when you leave Germany or when you go back to your daily activities, to not forget all of those stories that you're hearing, but to actually put those things in practice. <coughs> well, maybe I can, can add and give a... Um, like a very good example of how this common crown actually can play out. So one of our most powerful Talanoa sessions, which we just had yesterday, was uh, um, when we were sitting all together on the ground yeah, um, and talking about the question why everyone was actually here. Um, so on a personal level and not, not on an organizational or representing some organization, institution, country. And it turned out that we came all back to our previous intentions of caring about climate change, trying to provide solutions for it, being a part of solving the crisis. And this is the common ground we all share, like you said, intergenerational, doesn't matter of this if whether decision maker or youth. Okay. And I think that would be a powerful question to start any other Talanoa session as well. We may have in Budazon or Bonzon or wherever. Okay, thank you. And also I would just like to also reflect that when Sharin was talking from Sudan, like we have 10 years left to implement the NDCs from 2020 to 2030. So currently we are in 
2 degrees Celsius and we are trying to reduce it to 1 point, uh, to maintain it to 1.5 in 10 years of time. So governments and other organizations have three years of planning. So let's hope for the best. So we can have two more quick questions and quick reflection we can have. Quick question, we are running out of time, quick. Can we have the mics, please? Maybe you can scream. <laughs> yeah, we can. I was like, my friend here got to overstay. And we decided to, at that moment, announce uh, global, uh, the global goal, not sustainable development goal. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. 10 years yeah. ago, 10 years ago, I've been like my friends over the stage. And what happened is the United Nations announced the global, uh, global goals. At that moment, education, right in education, stuff like this. How we can do something like that? With government, they will not do anything at that moment, especially I'm from originally from the country, from the Middle East. We start to think, my colleagues and I, and we reach to, at that moment, to put the stickers over the streets and posters. And we increase awareness through, uh, through our uh, NGOs. The main thing and the main challenge for climate change or sustainability is you have to create a civic culture in your community and this community can be transfer the information to other communities in your country or in your region. You can use each Let single resource, you have to do it. Do it if tomorrow or if, now, or if it's now you create your YouTube channel and you start to record a movie or uh, a, a short video, it's just one minute increasing audiences, it will affect not only yourself or your friends, it will affect your wallet. For so, you have to believe in yourself. You can make the change. You can do something for climate change. Try using international uh, uh, information technology, use, using, uh, using social media, and the, the most important thing, you have to base and create informal education. You can do something like that with you in your organization, with your friend, your okay. with, with your other. Just to believe in yourself. Thank just you can do. Believe that you can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we're running out of time, so I'll quickly invite Anna to do the closing. <laughs> okay. So uh, young people are the the agents of change. Um, it is often said that young people are the future. But I would rather say that young people are the present um, because they are taking actions right now to combat climate change, whether on regional, whether on na national, whether on international levels. So we are accelerating climate action further, faster and together. That's the main thing, okay? So thank you all and thanks to the UNFCCC for giving us the platform of this Young and Future Generations Day to share our stories in the Talanoa Manda spirit. And uh, thanks to all of you for listening and for doing what you do in order to be the change makers we need. Vinaka Vakalevu. <laughs>